welcome to the most overrated, underappreciated, most viewed, underviewed podcast of all time. Welcome to the Prince of Fresh Air. Sorry for the messy intro. Just trying something new. I won't do it again. I am not Rihanna. I am not Alicia Keys. I apologize. Uh, I hope everybody's doing a, having a great day, having a great week, whether eating a cheeseburger, drinking coffee, watching the kids, stuck in traffic. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, before I bring on the, you know, my guest, no, I got something to say, and I know a lot of people might be surprised. Uh, I didn't make the FBI most wanted. That's right. Um, you know, true story. Someone pressed charges on me because I'm very charismatic, and they think that, uh, you know, I'm a danger to society because of it. I, I, I can't believe in myself. Uh, and then you might also be asking, why is he wearing sunglasses? He's inside while he's wearing sunglasses. Well, you know... I woke up this morning, TMZ was outside of my window snapping pictures. You know, I, I already kissed the baby, signed the autographs and all that stuff. I just want to be left alone, right? I just want to live my life. Canada's trying to smoke me out again. You know, I, I can't win. But regardless, we're not here for that. We're here to have fun, right? Uh, so my next guest, I actually had the pleasure to be on his podcast. Uh, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, somewhere around there. Um, and, you know, he was a, an amazing host. Uh, he has his own podcast. He's actually a co-host, actually, uh, of the Moped Outlaws. That's right, the Outlaw versus the most charismatic man. He's a creative producer. He has IMDb as well, you know, producer, uh, done some acting stuff as well. And he's also the host of Living With Greg, which I believe is on season nine, if I'm not mistaken. But he'll correct me because sometimes I am wrong. But regardless, we are here to welcome the man of the hour, the man, the myth, the legend, the moped outlaw, Gregory Wilker. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, man, it is my honor to be here with the most charismatic man in the universe. That's right. Oh, let me put, I saw TMZ again. I'm going to keep Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I got to say, it feels like a dark sunglasses day. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, actually, early, I was wearing my light color ones, but, you know, I, I, I'm already in black. I'm dark. It just fits the mood. So man but, in black. Exactly. I like it. Exactly. I like it. Uh, you know, it's been like I said, I was on your podcast. We had a great conversation. Uh your your co-host unfortunately isn't here, but you know what? I, I do want to just sit down and talk to you. There's a lot of things going on. Um, but you know, before we get into all of that, I think it's always nice to have, you know, just a sort of an introduction. So just tell, you know, a little bit about you. Uh, your journey a little bit, you know, how you got into podcasting and, and, and what, what the life is like, even though you may not be feeling the effects of Canada smoking us out, but you know, how do you feel and you know, how's life going so far for you? All right. Well, shoot, there's a whole lot to that question. So regarding the smoke of Canada and what's going on with you in New York, you know, I'm in California. And as you guys well know, we've had a few solid summers of smoke and fire so I know what you're going through. It's not fun. No. And um, my journey to podcasting was like nine years ago. Um, I've been doing web stuff since like 98, 99, and always kind of interested in what's going on with that realm. And, you know, podcasting was happening. And um, I'd always wanted to do one. Uh, part of it was to learn the discipline of the show must go on. So regardless of what's going on in one's life, you got a schedule, you hit it. And the other thing was to learn the technology behind it, what's involved with creating a podcast. And um, I was doing uh, videos for a doctor here in California. And one of my close friends has Huntington's disease, which is very similar to Parkinson's, Alzheimer's Ooh. and epilepsy all combined into one. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, and the doctor interviewed him. And at one point, they both spayed, spaced out. They were both just sitting there. And because um, the doctor has his own chronic illnesses he deals with. And that was why the the reason for the video. Anyway, I thought, oh, damn, that would be funny if like you asked a question and then you just both sat there. And um, they <laughs> thought that was funny, too. But the doctor didn't want to do it. As my friend and I left, I thought, hey, why don't you and I just do it? And that became the first episode of Live With Greg. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I asked a question and then we just both sat there as loud as we could until someone broke. 
And um, what was hella funny is some of the feedback, like people reading things into it. Oh, you know, that was like this sort of Dada artistic statement about life. And I was like, I don't know. It was just us sitting there. Anyway. <laughs> And, and um, it's been a great excuse to meet people like yourself, um, you know, meet people that are in a realm of life that I'm interested in. And I just feel everyone's got a story, no matter who they are, you know, from the dirtiest homeless person with nothing left to lose to a Steve Bezos or a Saudi, you know, prince, like everyone's got a story and we learn from stories. Oh, that's beautifully said. That's that's very true. You know, you know, it's funny because <clears throat> my podcast started the exact same way. Uh, even though nobody was living me at the time, but my buddy, uh, I think it was just during the pandemic. I think it was uh during those times when we was getting wildfires back in uh, in California. I was out. I was living out there, and I think one just one Saturday, I just I sat on the stairs. I got my phone open. Called my buddy. Said, "Hey, you free for a second? That's how we did the first episode. Uh, clearly, I don't do that now. But, <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, you know, let me ask you, Moped Outlaws, that's a really cool name. How did you come up with that? Because when I first heard about it, I thought Texas, you know, somewhere in the Midwest. And here you are living in San Francisco, right? So yes, uh, how, how did that come about? All right. So Mark and I decided to do a podcast together and um, we wanted to do, be a bit irreverent, a bit tongue in cheek. Um, and we came up with the uh, title Cracker Jacks and kind of playing off Cracker, you know, white boys, Cracker. And um, we're very, very immersed in the train of thought of healing racism in this country. And a close friend of his who um, actually does a course for people who identify as white to heal racism. And I partook in that course. Anyway, she was saying, you guys shouldn't use that name. It's just, it's, it is so triggering. And I thought, well, there's one person's opinion. Another friend of mine who's a person of color actually lives in your neighborhood. He was like, go for it. And he's your reverend. He's, you know, like, fuck the world. That's his sort of thing. Um, <laughs> But then there's a woman who's a mother in my life and I went to her and she's a person of color. And I said, what do you think of this title? And she said, um, I know you love it. And there's a lot, you know, I hear your point of view, but my opinion, not a good idea. She said, I know you, someone who doesn't know you potentially is going to have the wrong impression of what you are and what you're attempting to do so mark and i talked and we thought that, you know we want to invite people in we don't want something that right at the door is locking that door tight right so we had an episode and um some friends were jumping on and we were like looking for a title and i told a story of when i was in my 20s and i had three ounces of mushrooms rammed out into gram bags and had them in VHS cases back in the day when you rented VHSs from oh, stores. Wow. <laughs> and I was on this beat up moped at night, no headlight, just trashed. And the police came after me and I tried to outrun them and I didn't <laughs> make it. And I was taken to jail, but they never found the mushrooms. And one of the friends that was listening in, she said, moped outlaws. And what <laughs> you can't <laughs> what uh, you can't make that up you, you can't <laughs> that's wow. it yeah <laughs> that's actually yeah. pretty cool wow that's probably the, one of the most unique names of a story or the uh, unique stories behind a podcast name i've ever heard that's pretty clever <laughs> Like, I don't think it hit either one of us like on point, but it definitely settled in. And by the end of the episode, we were like, there, there's our new name. So, wow, that is it. It actually stands out. It's a, it's a clever name. You know, I think, it, you. you know, it, it's definitely not something when I, I never jumped to, you know, that, you know, story when I thought about it, I just thought about two guys who just do what they do, enjoy what they love, you know, doing what they love and nobody's stopping them. So they hear that story, it's like, huh, 
Maybe I shouldn't be on the FBI most wanted. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, one of the things I like about it is I think um, one of the things I resonate with you is there's an outlaw vibe in the sense like there's a lot of rules on this planet that aren't meant to be abided by. You know, I think you and I both believe in a higher power uh, commonality with life and a respect for life. And some rules and laws are not created in respect to that. So to be true to ourselves, we are going to be outlaws. And then the moped aspect kind of softens that whole vibe of gangster violence, chaos. Right. It's a nice, it brings it down just a touch. It's like, you know, a little sweet, a little salty, but it balances out. I get, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do agree with you on, uh, you know, some rules are meant to be broken, right? And we live in a world where nothing is black and white. Every, you know, this gray, you know, there's all the colors of, as well. And I think for me, you know, I actually just did a um, a piece for a newspaper. They was doing an article for me. And one of the questions they asked me was like, are you a risk taker? And and what do you define as a risk taker? And I always say, you know, life is all about choices. And you sometimes you have to take risks. You know, some people like to play safe, and I understand that. You know, some people would just complete, don't give a crap about nothing. You know, there's people like that, but there's also some people like us who, you know, decide to take risks, you know, in life. And I think that's the most important thing. You know, I may not be a gambler, but I like to bet on myself too. Yeah. So, you know, I think yeah. that's important. I think people need to risk, you know, throw, you know, make, you know, you know, be true to yourself, but also take that leap of faith. You don't always have to play it safe. You know, life is all about roller coasters up and down. You never know what's going to happen regardless. So you know, might as well make the fun of it, right? Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that was beautifully said. I, I couldn't even thought about that better. <laughs> I didn't even think <laughs> I just said it. Um, and I hope someone wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen back to it. I'll write it down for you. All right. All right. <laughs> now let, let's get into some fun stuff. Right. And I think we talked about it with you. And uh, when I was on your podcast and, you know, AI, you know, it's been blown up. I'm seeing a lot more articles about it, about uh, I actually just read a, uh, uh, it was a article. I think it was by Forbes. The twelve jobs that will probably disappear in the next ten years. And you know, you're you're a producer. Like I said, you've done some some films, and you know, you produce your own stuff as well. You know, AI's is here, right? We talked yep. about it, but I want right. to get your opinion because I feel like I did most of the talking last time. Um, but you know, as a producer, as one you know, a podcast host, as one who has your own series going on. How do you how do you feel about AI? What's happening? Because on one side, there's people like, "Hey, AI is here. You know, it's it's here to help us. Uh, we should embrace it." And then there's some people that say, "Well, we need to be careful because you know this is another thing that could potentially go wrong. You know, our jobs will be destroyed and lost, and people's gonna have trouble finding work." Uh, so, what is your opinions on it? Well, the simple thing is, it's here and it's not going away. So it doesn't matter whether you welcome it, you are afraid of it, whatever, it's here. So from that perspective, um, I personally think it's wise to embrace it. And part of that embracing is um, being aware of potentials that could be bad and doing one's best to have some forethought with its integration in life. Um, it's interesting, like the episode we did together, there was a lot of talk about the ability to create an actor. And so you create a film and that person in the film isn't really there. It's all computerized. And so like taking a Matt Damon and instead of paying 26 million for him to show up and be in your film, you get 4 million for the right of his image and his voice and it's created. I don't think we're there right now. Um, but with the producer hat on, that's a very inviting scenario. Um, a producer hat is to create a product that is going to be profitable. 
-hmm. at least break even, but you want it to be profitable. You're in a business and you need a profit to stay in business. So that's a very inviting perspective. I don't know if it'll ever be realized. I was listening to, I forget the um, comedian's name. I was just listening to him on a podcast and they were talking about AI generating jokes. And he thought that um, AI will never be able to truly create a routine that's going to work. But maybe that 10th joke at a award ceremony where the first nine are hitting. So now the audience is warm and they're laughing. Maybe that 10th joke could be generated by AI. Uh, You know, it's a good point, but you know what? I, you know, I was, I think I mentioned it on your podcast. I I remember I was watching uh, the series wired on YouTube and this scientist had robots that, you know, she could command them like Siri, you know, when you say, hey, Siri, do this. These robots, she could pet them. They make a noise. Uh, she could tell them, hey, grab this pen and, and give it to me. That type of thing. Now we're seeing, you know, college students write whole essays with AI. Uh, I'm sure professors, you know, not throwing nobody on the bus because I don't know for sure. But I'm sure a lot of people are using AI now in corporate world, uh, professional settings, schools. Um, and it, and it's here. And I, the reason why I asked you about the producer thing. Um, I was talking to my manager uh, two days ago about this, but, you know, the writer strike is happening and, you know, a lot of people are on board with it. Right. But I also see the other side, mostly actors who are saying, Hey man, let's go, man. I'm trying to work. I'm, I'm trying to make some money. I'm trying to be on TV. What's taking so long? Why, why y'all complaining? You know, just, just, just take your money and go home. Right. And I think a lot of people don't truly understand the impact that the writer strike is actually trying to achieve. You know, the thing with AI, you know, I, I think I have mentioned this too. You know, 20, what is, yes, 20 years ago, I Robot Will Smith came out, right? And mm-hmm. we saw the whole thing with uh, uh, the robots, you know, programmed to help everybody. And then they, they went rogue and took it over. Uh, technology has taken over, right? We didn't think that was going to happen. Terminator 2, Skynet, you know, went rogue. The internet created its own thing. Uh, nobody thought that was going to happen. And look at it now. AI is here. You can literally go on AI anywhere. And it even even most jobs now, when you call, you know, the government agencies, you call certain jobs. Um, McDonald's, for instance, have stores with all computer uh, or um, robot gen- uh, working now. It's here. And I think the issue is people don't realize, but when these corporations, the big brands, you know, for us, being in the entertainment industry, Warner Brothers, all of them, if they realize, hey, you know, I don't need to Marvel fences. Marvel's like, you know, our films normally generate uh, our budget is usually two hundred fifty that million dollars, right? Now, I don't need to have all these people. I don't need to have all these people on payroll. We can find shortcuts. So instead of two hundred fifty million, let's bring that down to about seventy five million, and for them. You know, it's great because, you know, saving money, the more money they generate in the box office, the more profit, right? But for the writers, the actors, the producers, directors, the sound gaffers, you know, all the people behind the scenes, that means less work for them because they're probably going to cut some of those jobs. Two, it's going to be very competitive because now you're competing with technology. Three, it's going to be, you know, less money involved because now these corporations are saying, hey, you know, uh, Gregory, I, we know you're a producer, right? But uh, AI wrote the script and we just need him to perfect it. We don't really need your input right now. So instead of giving you $5 million, how about you, you take 70, 750000 right? To the average person, seems like a lot of money. But you have a lifestyle to maintain. You got a family. Uh, so it's not about being greedy. It's about being paid rightly and protecting your work. I think anybody... You know, whether you're an actor, an athlete, you know, you work at McDonald's, whatever. You want to protect yourself and your work. You want to get paid for your service. So I think that's what's important. I do agree on that. But, you know, like I said, there's some people say, hey, you're being greedy. You need to just, you know, sit down, shut up and let everybody else make some money. Uh, What do you think about that? Well, the whole you're being greedy thing, um, I think it's ridiculous. I think everyone should have 
like free will, a part of free will is to strive to excel to one's best. So greed is, I think, a term that is not appropriate to the conversation. Um, I, my personal belief is very spiritual. I think human beings are a part of life, nature, this eternal aspect of reality. And just as a sprout finds a crack in cement and grows through it, and then slowly it breaks that cement apart and that cement crumbles back into the earth. I think that humanity and life will always find a way through the technology to thrive. And there's an aspect of like who Percy is that AI cannot be programmed. It's that human element of um, imagination where like, you know, everything said do a left turn and the man went right. Like, whoa, where'd that come from? That's yeah. that, you know, I know labels are triggering, but I'd say that's the God seed of who you are, you, Percy, who I am, Greg, who humanity is. It's that where everything said go left, they went right. And it turns out right was a great choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. You know, the, the one thing I will say, you know, a robot can't capture these boyish good looks, this amazing hair. <laughs> so I'm not too worried. <laughs> That hair will always be unique to you. <laughs> hey, but you know what, man? It's technology. I, I'm not putting past nothing anymore. Uh, although I think I have a good shot at this. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's one of those things, you know, it's like I said, I grew up in a, I'm in that generation where, you know, I didn't really grow up, you know, with the, you know, the big box TV and all that stuff. I, you know, I grew up playing outside, but also grew up, an era where technology was booming. We had kick Facebook, Twitter, you know, so I, I've seen it. Right. And I think the issue with AI is I, I, I was watching a, a, a video interview, um, ice cube, you know, actor, you know, rapper did, and it's going to be the over-reliance on AI that's going to be an issue because now, you know, like I said, these corporations looking at it like, Hey, we get to save money. We don't need to pay you a livable salary. These machines work for free. We don't need you, right? But at the same time, what was going to end up happening, which I think I'm the only reason I'm talking about this stuff, is eventually we already seeing fast food jobs disappear. We already seeing farm work disappear. We're already seeing a lot of corporate jobs being disappear. We've seen a lot of people in tech getting fired recently. Uh, apparently, uh, a lot of major entertainment uh, companies, I know ESPN is just laying off some of the most long tenured, you know, on camera talent. It, it is getting to that point where they are starting to realize, hey, we don't need to pay people this much money. We have easier things that we can program or that works for us directly. You know, we don't have to worry about a Percy going on camera, smiling, you know, going off script. You know, we could do our thing over here. And, you know, it, it's really something that, like I said, I embrace it. I, I think, you know, especially with Tesla, Tesla has made cars even more cooler in the sense that now you could drive by, you know, I, I one of my buddies, he drove from LA to Texas. He moved there and 85% of the trip was self-driven. The car was driving by itself. He's playing video games, eating, I mean, sleeping, enjoying himself. You know, that that's the, that's going to become our thing. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of the Jeffersons. It's going to be like that, where, <laughs> you know, we got robots cleaning for us, going to work for us. We'll probably only leave the house if we want to go do something. But that that's going to be our future, probably in the next 10 years, I could say. And that's being generous. Well, so a couple of things. One thing that comes to mind is I just thought of this experience I had in, that I think shows what I mean by the imagination that I don't think AI will ever be able to do. One of the films I produced was Baja. And it's this young kid who is with friends in a luxury RV going down into Baja, Mexico. And it's just a fiasco. And at the end, there was this element of kind of attempting to, you know, you want your story to land on a period you know, have a really great landing. 
and it just was sort of soft and they're re- they're filming this sort of last scene and um the actor after a few takes of the way it was written the actor said hey do you mind if i try something the director said sure go for it and what he did his parents are there the scenes him and his parents and he just reiterates the entire story to them of what happened and why the rv isn't there waiting for them <laughs> and it was perfect it summarized the whole story and landed it on that 10 point landing and that was out of his imagination that was out of his spirit of who he is and so i always believe for the pursuit of excellence that is going to be an important piece to that pursuit yeah no you you know there are some things that it can't replace certain things uh you know someone was mentioning i remember you know in the, in the cases where you have to talk to people you know life isn't black and white black and white and there's going to it is going to be hard to make to put those type of uh, you know ai and you know robots into you know situations where they have to judge jury and sometimes even execution people you know imagine if the justice system went to ai that can, you know, a lot of people be sitting in jail. A lot of people, you know, might get off scot free. But you know, there's going to be a lot of issues because nothing is ever black and white, right? And I think, you know, machines don't understand human emotion. They don't understand that, you know, you might do something for your children that, you know, is excusable to many and shouldn't, you know, require a harsh of a sentence or whatever the case may be. There are certain aspects, even with comedy, you know, live performances and stuff. But what we have been seeing. Is I know in LA they have the Tupac show where yeah. you can watch a whole digital reenactment of Tupac. You know, yeah. it's going to become like that. And I'm, you know, even with music, they are starting to use, you know, Michael Jackson, Tupac, all these artists that, you know, unfortunately passed away many years ago, even decades ago. And they're rewriting songs that are currently out for them and they're, and they're making their voice that sing these songs. It, it's creepy. It, well, it's creepy in the sense that. I'm surprised technology could do this. It's also cool because like we could do things we never thought was possible, but we also have to be careful in the sense that how many music people are going to lose, uh, you know, you know, f- freedom of control. How many of them is going to be able to own their music? Now they're going to be competing. Now with only labels and other artists. Now they compete with technology that already has a, a, a one up on many people now. So it, it, I don't know. It, it's a tricky one, you know? Well, I think there's an element of us as human beings, we need to step up our moral game. And um, what came to mind, I don't know if you saw that show, I think it's on Netflix that Ricky Gervais did, where his wife passed away from cancer. I think they did three seasons. And there was this one beautiful scene where this woman's talking about laws and she's saying in free will. And she's, it, it came to this point and I'm going to be paraphrasing, but he said to her, well, yeah, a person should have the right to kill someone. I am killing as many people as I want to, which is zero. I don't want to kill anyone. And that like part of, I think the danger we consider with AI and what's going on is potentially I can create a video of you, Percy, doing something that you weren't even in the place where it is being shown, but it sure looks real and that could create a lot of trouble. So now we're relying on my moral standards to not want to do that. I don't want to fuck with your life in that way. Yeah, no, you're right. You know, free will, uh, free will, which is important because I don't have free will right now because of Canada and they got <laughs> <laughs> you me... do, you know, you do like you're choosing to take care of your health and stay indoors. That's true. I feel like, uh, you know, Canada, I'm coming for you now. Um, <laughs> but you know, we, we're going to take a, just a little short break. You know, we're going to come back. I'm going to welcome the sponsors, which is nobody, but you know, I got to give a shout out to something. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to just take a small, uh, quick break. We'll be right back. Sit around. Don't forget, we will be back with the most charismatic man and the moped outlaw himself. And stay tuned. We'll see you in a second.
we are back. You know, part two of the episode, we, we, you know, we talked about AI. And before we continue, I just want to give a shout out to my sponsors. You might wonder why I got on sunglasses. Well, my sponsor today is nobody. And that's why I had on the sunglasses. I was ashamed. <laughs> and I was disgusted. <laughs> but I will say this episode, this podcast is brought to you by Spotify for Podcasters. So if you're looking to start a podcast, you already have a podcast and, you know, you need a, a better a uh, whole platform you need you know a way to start your podcast uh this is a great episode uh you know tool to use great platform amazing uh quick and easy uh and you know like i always say if you want to be like me it takes a little work so now i'm kidding uh <laughs> but anyway we're back with um yes, my guest then you know, we was talking about ai for a little bit i want to switch gears a little bit because some stuff has been happening recently i want to get your take on the uh, government the government, you know, it's been a while since I've done an episode <laughs> addressing the government, but the Supreme Court is back at it again. Um, the uh, you know, Joe Biden have made the student loan forgiveness, and right. you know, recently the Supreme Court decided, hey, ha, y'all not getting no relief, you know, f all. Um, now there are people who think that's the right choice. Hey, you took out those loans, go pay for them, right? And then there's other people saying, you know, the pandemic has changed the job market. A lot of people aren't working in the fields that they, you know, they went to school for. Um, and, you know, we are taking out all these loans. You know, I was 18. I didn't realize that, you know, taking out $100,000 of student loans was, you know, a big thing until now. So uh, how do you feel about that, that ruling? And what is your opinions on this whole situation? Well, um, I got to say, when I heard that there was going to be relief, I was celebrating because I have student debt. Um, however, I believe ultimately I signed the documents. It's my responsibility. Um, I'd be happy if someone came and said, hey, you don't have to pay that back. Celebrate. But on the other hand, I think it's my debt. And um, I think we're in a recession. Um People are getting laid off, and I believe that's real. Um, but, you know, my daughter paid off her entire student loan, and she has worked hard. It wasn't my money. It was her money. So there is an element of um, why should I be taken off the hook when she did the work to get off the hook on her own? Like, what is she getting? Nothing. Right. So I think uh, relieving student debt would have been nice, but not a requirement. Yeah. I Honestly, I didn't get my hopes up about it. I doubted it. Luckily, I didn't graduate too much, but that alone would have wiped out all my stuff. So I would have been happy with it. But, I, you know, I've been on the fence with it because I always say, you know, people need a life is all about choices. Right. When we said when we were talking about earlier about taking risks, you know, that's a risk you're willing to take. And I think one of the issues that I think this address is the need for people to go to these Ivy League schools, you know, for a theater degree, right? It really shows that, look, you know, people need to do a better choice in choosing colleges, right? I'm an actor. I went to school for theater. I never thought in my mind to go to Ivy League school for acting because I didn't want, I didn't want to graduate $200,000 in debt. Unless you're lucky you know, become a successful movie star, which I'm going to be, by the way, uh, just putting that out there. But unless that happens, you're going to be struggling for many years. As we know, the starving artist is real. You're going to be working a lot of minimum wage jobs. You're not going to be working, you know, high end corporate jobs if you're trying to pursue that type of career. So you need to make a better choice in terms of schooling. But we also have lived in a society where you had to go to college or, you know, people made you feel like you had to go to school. And if you didn't go to some of these big schools, you know, uh, you're going to be competing with the Harvard, you know, guy. Do you really think, you know, going to that community college is going to compete with that? And I think a lot of things um, have and need to be addressed. You know, the transparency of, you know, student loans. A lot of people didn't realize. I didn't realize, to be honest with you, until my third year that I was taking out loans. I just thought, you know, when I'm signing my, my you know, every semester, uh, spring semester, uh, fall semester, actually, when I was signing my my um my scholarship stuff, 
I didn't realize I was taking that long, right, you know. Right. And you know, when I, you know, upon graduating, I had to take my entry, uh, my leaving college class. I was like, wait, what? I gotta pay. I gotta pay this back, <laughs> you know. And I think there's some transparency that needs to be happened. Um, but on the other hand, I do say, hey, you decided to go part of your life away at Yale. You know, you didn't get the job you want. That don't mean that the government gets a free handout. Uh, give you a free handout. But even then, even if they did scrap it, let's say uh Supreme Court passed it and said, you know what? It's going to reflect. Okay, you may not see that big balance now. It's like a car. You know, you go into a dealership. The 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 guy says, hey, I'll knock down a car price for you. But I'm a rate. He didn't tell you. He raised the interest on you as well. So yeah, you may not think that fifty thousand you know, dollar price tag isn't as high when he knocks it down to thirty. But when your you know your interest goes from five percent to nineteen percent, <laughs> you know, so it, right. it it's definitely something that it is hard because it's like on one hand you do want to help people, you know, especially the pandemic to now, you know, things have changed, you know, people, like you said, it's like a recession, and then the price of groceries, even even to this day, I go, I went on Amazon, you know, fresh to, uh, last night, uh, a dozen of eggs is almost eight dollars in the city, it's ridiculous, so. You know, and it's also the fact that many people, unless you have private loans, haven't been paying student loans in what five years, you know, three, four years. So I don't know. It, it's a tricky one. Um, what do you? Th but what do you? So what do you think goes from? Do you think that uh, this is the end? Do you think the conversation is over? Do you think that there's going to be uh, some pushback? And they'll probably revisit it, or do you think, hey? He would just strap back in to start paying again in a couple months. Yeah, I think it's over. Um, and here's it. So when it comes to things of this nature, there is a part of me that's conspiracy oriented. <laughs> and I would not put it past the Biden Harris administration that there's a train of thought, hey, why don't we announce this? It's never going to happen. But, you know, it'll get people on our side. It'll get to the Supreme Court, shut it down, and we're all good to go. Um, we share the same. <laughs> we share the same. <laughs> Which is why I appreciate, like, you brought politics up. And I got to say, I am ignorant as fuck about <laughs> politics. It, I don't pay too much attention to it. But I do like Marianne Williamson and... Uh, Kennedy Jr., I, I, I think John F. Kennedy Jr., who are both running as Democrat challengers to Biden. And I think they're a fresh voice. Yeah. Um, you know, in hindsight, I thought um, President Obama was a fresh voice, and I think he was. And I think he and Michelle did an excellent job as the pinnacle of leadership for our country. But of course, things started coming out and hearing that, you know, I, I think one stat I heard was there were more droid bombings um, during his administration than any other. And he's a human being. So I think there is an element of us humans. We want the savior to come and make it all right for us instead of being our own savior. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's human nature, which is why AI, I was talking about AI because greed becomes a thing, you know, and I think, you know, with the student loan thing, I agree with you. And one of the reasons why I stopped talking about politics is very divisive, right? But I will say, I, I, to be honest with you, I would not be surprised if they knew it was going to fail. I, this was too good to be true. Whenever something is too good to be true, it, it always it's always something uh, negative about it. You know, I learned that from Supernatural. I mean, you know, but <laughs> come on, if somebody is willing to give you, t you know, I've heard this story. Uh, so if someone is willing to fly you out on a private jet without meeting you, it's too good to be true. You know, yes, it's, it's, it, that, yeah. that just don't happen. And if it does, it, it, you know, it's probably someone you know. And, yeah. You or know, check that suitcase they handed you at the <laughs> gate. <laughs> hey, the 15 grand just to take that to where you're going. Come on. You know, yeah. it life is interesting. It's you know, these days where you feel like it's kicking you in the seat of the ass, 
And then there's other days where you feel like you're being blessed. And that's the that's the beauty of it. But th- th- this thing, I knew it wasn't going to happen. But I will say there is something else that the Supreme Court did that turned a lot of people's heads. This happened yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. So the Supreme Court affirmative action, which I have admittedly benefited from uh, to some degree. But affirmative action that has allowed many minorities, Hispanic, Black, uh, Asian, uh, Indian, you know, anybody who is not white, gave them an opportunity to go to some of these schools that normally they wouldn't have been able to go to, Mm -hmm. right? And the Supreme Court decided, hey, no more of that. We're, We're striking down race. No more race on applications. Although, like I said, if a Shaniqua applies to a Yale, they will know that's not an Asian, <laughs> that's not a white person. So they kind of could put two to two together. Um, but, you know, there's many people who say, hey, affirmative action is racist uh, and makes minorities feel like, you know, it's giving minorities a handout, which mind blows me that people even think that, but to each their own. And then there's people that say that was the wrong absolute choice. Um, what they need to be focusing on is, uh, I've got the name of it, but it's, uh, uh, the idea that let's say you donated to Yale when you went to Yale and Yale feels indebted to you, right? So your daughter has been able to go there. Her right. children will be able to go there. Her, right. you know, her grandchildren will be able to go there. It's a family thing, a legacy thing. Right. Um, many people are benefiting from legacy um, you know, uh, acceptances. Um, right. that's something that needs to be addressed. That many people can just donate some money, and they can continue their legacy. And many people lose out just because Johnny donated fifty thousand dollars twenty years ago. Um, but before we get to that part, how do you feel about affirmative action? Do you think it was the right call? How do you feel about that? Okay. So I'm unfamiliar of the call. But I can speak to affirmative action with my own opinion, of course. Um, I think it's necessary when one looks at the ramifications of racism and colonialism that this country was built upon. um, The red zoning of the 40s, 50s, 60s which allowed white America to accumulate wealth in, you know, low income families was not given to people of color. So right. now we're in the 80s, 90s, 2000, and the generations are benefiting from that historical accumulation of wealth. That's just one example. So for an individual to say, it's not fair to give advantage to people of color. Well, it wasn't fair to disadvantage people of color. You, it, you got to write it by moving energy from the one to the other. That's what it looks like. It looks like, oh, now you were disadvantaged. Now you have an advantage. And I think it's also important to keep in mind that it's not historical. It's still being experienced as you and I are talking. So exactly. any energy to bring balance to that, I think is good energy. <laughs> you know, when you said that, it made me think of uh, Avengers Endgame when Thor, uh, when uh, Thanos had that thing with Gamora and he was balancing. You know, it made me think of that. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I you know, a lot of people I think are missing a point with affirmative action. It's not about handing out. Now, do some people get through the system who probably don't, you know, is, you know, using it, you know, to their advantage? Of course. Um, but that's what everything. There's always going to be people who snake through the system, regardless of what you're doing. And I think people are being, um, you know, aren't seeing the bigger picture with this. You know, I would be, you know, a fool to say I benefited from affirmative action. You know what? Nobody else deserves it. You know, let everybody else work hard and take out all this money that they can't afford. And, you know, good luck to them. No, it's this. I heard uh, someone say this before. Racism hasn't died. It's just now hidden. You know, back then it was open to have a slave. It was open to be racist to people. Now 
if someone doesn't want a black man to do something or a Latino or Asian do something, they could just say, hey, you weren't qualified enough, even though you probably have better qualifications than somebody else. But if they don't like you, they could discriminate and they could give you, you know, a reason. And I think affirmative action was not about, you know, being racist to white people. You know, I think it was the uh, giving people the opportunity. And so many people use their experience to justify why they don't believe in it. Not everybody has parents that can afford college. Not everybody has parents who could give them money to go to college. Uh, not everybody has parents. Uh, not a lot. Well, everybody has parents, but you. Not everybody has living parents or parents that you know can help them financially. Not everybody lives in a, a you know a area where the school system is great. You know, I grew up in an urban setting of New York City. I was fortunate that I went to school that, you know, did pretty well academic and performing wise and helped me. Not everybody had that, you know, not everybody lived in a district that had that type of opportunity. So I think it's disingenuous for people to say affirmative action is doing more harm than good. I think it's giving people a voice to finally show that there are very talented and, you know, hardworking students out here who don't get a shot because certain people in power don't want them to be there. And it happens. I think it's weird that people still act like racism disappeared. It didn't. It's still here. Right. Not everybody's right. racist. Now, I want to call you racist. I want to call everybody racist. But there are people, you know, in power, you know, which is another issue I have. Why 80-something-year-old people running a Supreme Court is beyond me. But, you know, that's a conversation for another day. Um, but let me ask you this. Uh, and I had mentioned it earlier. Where the legacy hand me downs when it comes to school, that's a huge problem. We've we've heard of cases, uh, USC, some of these other schools where people with money are paying off the schools, paying off the professors to help get their kids in these schools, and you know many hardworking students are being denied because of it. Um, why do you think that is something that needs to be addressed, especially when we're talking about you know the bigger schools, um, you know that type of thing happening? That's a great question. Um, I think that m more important is the criminal aspects that are happening that are tr are available to the wealthy. Here in Marin County, where I live, just recently, like a few years ago, there was a bust of a bunch of families that would hire a guy to get their kids into Yale, Harvard, USC, et cetera, through false scholarship things. He would be able to build a picture and the school would accept them and there's donations involved. That is criminal. And that should be, you know, tapped down. Um, the legacy piece is difficult because you want to be in the entertainment industry. Let's say I give you $2 million to make a film. You make that film. It does all right, maybe. You know, I give you another $3 million. Let's say a period of time has gone by and you've now got six films that I've been a part of as an executive producer financing. We're happy with each other. We're friends. We're like doing things. Like, oh, Percy, you know what? My daughter wants to be an actress. Do you think you could give her a shot at this? there's a strong possibility you're going to say, yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. That's a fair point. That is a fair point. And, I, you know, I would say it, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one because, you know, a lot of schools, they realize, hey, the more money to help us, the better, right? And I think one of the things when it comes to colleges is even even in Hollywood, we, you know, I think legacy, nepotism, and all that stuff, if it really truly benefits the project, I wouldn't mind, right? But when you're having people who really don't deserve it, who's not really putting in the work, and, you know, the industry is changing, I will say. It's becoming more about finding new talent, which I, I appreciate because, you know, back then it used to be, oh, yo, Johnny Depp, you have a child, let's bring him in, Uh, you know, uh, uh, Daniel Craig, you have a son, bring him in. Everybody was kind of like that. It's still like that, you know, obviously, but it's a it's a changing guard. 
I think as new people start coming in, the idea of uh, being inclusive and diverse is becoming a big thing. And especially with the thing with at least Hollywood is most of the, those people we're talking about are white people. And it's not a racist thing at all. But you don't really see a lot of people of color in Hollywood, you know, having nepotism because normally a lot of them haven't been around all long enough to actually do that. So the industry has always been, you know, the leading man, white man, leading girl, white girl. So a lot of those people who grew up in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, who's still in the industry, their kids are starting to benefit from that too. Timothy Chalamet. Uh, but, you know, as it's, it's long as I don't, I, like I said, I would be a fool to say I'm mad at them for taking the opportunity. Absolutely not. Anybody, if they was given an opportunity, if their parents were able to hand them something for free and get them to a better place, would be a fool not to take it. So I don't, no, take anything away from that. Uh, you mentioned Ice Cube earlier in an interview you saw him on. Did it happen to be the Joe Rogan podcast he was just on? Oh no, it was a it was a smaller YouTube podcast. Okay, well he was just on uh, Joe Rogan, and I haven't finished it, but he was talking about his son playing him on um, that NWA film that came out, and one of the things he talked about is the two years of bust ass work his son did to get that role and so i believe that what you and i and any true person has in mind is longevity we don't want that one off you know hit we want a career we want a lifetime and so nepotism by itself isn't going to create a lifetime career and um a person on the surface could say well ice cube just handed that role to his kid but then you hear ice cube talk about no not at all in fact he put challenges in the way to kind of see does my son really want to do this and not only did his son meet those challenges he took on his own challenges exactly. so that he was on point when the moment came to audition and he had to audition and get that role. Absolutely. You know, and that's what it's all about. You know, I have a, a close friend who auditioned for a very big biopic film. And he was telling me, um, you know, he almost had it. But, you know, family was involved and they ended up choosing somebody who's in the family. And you can't get mad at that because, like I said, if the role was reversed, you take the opportunity to, right? All mm -hmm. I'm saying, and I think some people are saying is, hey, you know, let's just make sure these people are actually working hard for it, right? Because we mm -hmm. hear these stories that a lot of these kids, they get into these colleges and Hollywood or whatever, and they just, you know, a-holes, not really doing anything, partying, drinking, you know, rather than not caring. Because ultimately, their mother and dad is, you know, the one behind it, you know, sacrificing their money and their, their reputation. And I think that's what it's about. You know, like I said, I will never discredit anybody who's enjoying the fruits of their parents' labor. Absolutely not. Just, you know, got to get it. Well, two, two women come to mind, Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian. Oh. And um, the thing is, like, they have long-standing careers. And I remember when Paris first put out a single, everyone trashed it. I trashed it. I was like, what is this shit? You know, who the fuck are you you just bought this but she took the hits and kept doing it took the hits and kept doing it. and now from what i know part of who she is is she goes to nightclubs and djs she puts on a show and um kim kardashian's another one like if it was simply a blow job and reality tv that would not create a 10 plus growing career and that's what she has so i think both those ladies are showing individuals who are actually doing a lot of hard work behind the scenes to create what they have yeah kim is doing a lot of hard work <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> i mean i know i know she got fans listening so i want to 
It couldn't have been easy to be living with um, Kanye twenty four seven. True, uh, but you know, you like you know, Kim Kardashian. I have no beef with her. Is she talented? She's a smart businesswoman. I would give her that. Absolutely. There's a lot of people in this in this world who are just smart and know about brand and how to capitalize. I I used to think negatively of her. Now I don't really, you know, that's not my space. She's doing what she's doing, and I don't hate. I've learned to accept the fact that there are going to be people who benefit from, you know, people in the industry. You know, your family has longevity with people. When you form those type of relationships with people in power, you know, it's hard to justify, you know, it's hard for them not to take those opportunities because anybody else will switch place with Elon Musk. Anybody else will switch a place with Kim Kardashian. So I think it's disingenuous for me to say they don't deserve it because if I was in her position, I would do the same thing, right? Yeah. You know, there's a Prince song and I remember hearing the lyric. And again, I can't remember it exactly. But in essence, he was saying, are you going to hate on this person just because they're rich? And that kind of turned my mind. I was like, Oh yeah, I do have a chip on my shoulder with someone just because of the rich. I don't know them, but I'm already blowing them off because they're wealthy. And yet I also want to be wealthy. So what's going on? <laughs> and I believe that you and I have a commonality and that when we're engaged with something, we want to work hard and we want to be with people who are working hard. Right. And um, my belief going back to Kim and Paris and other people, I'm believing they're hard workers. And even Kanye, he's a hard worker. Like I think engaging with those people would be a positive experience because at the bottom line, it's the work that's important, not the ego. And we're all working hard to that single vision. Yeah, you have to put in work. Nothing is easy in life. And, you know, there's a lot of people who feel that I, I used to be like that, you know, when I graduated school, just sitting around thinking Netflix is going to call me. Mom was going, <laughs> hey, hey, Percy, you got nice hair, come over. You know, things don't work like that. And I think, you know, when I talk about the reason why I mentioned that, um, the whole college legacy thing, was I saw a lot of people commenting on it. And and when we're talking about it, I definitely agree. It's like, can you really fault these kids for taking advantage of the fact that, you know, they family has friends in high places. You know, a lot of people hate Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and all of them because it's not because they, you know, are bad people. Well, you may not agree with them, but a lot of it is because a lot of people wish they had that type of money. Imagine waking up any day and saying, hey, I want to go to Paris and I want to eat caviar on the beach. You don't have to worry about calling off. You don't have to worry about money. You can just go up and do it. A lot of yep. people wish they had a life they can do that, right? Yep. And I think, you know, we need to take a step back and, and not put our insecurities and jealousy on other people. And the reason, and I only say that because my thing with the legacy school is not so much about favoritism. Obviously, that's going to happen. You know, it's just more so these, you know, when you go in these processes, these schools, when they do this, just make sure that you hold them to the same standard you would somebody else, right? Right. Because it I don't agree. make any sense that these kids, yeah, they're getting in these schools for free. Absolutely. They probably deserve it because their parents contribute a lot. But if they just smoking up the school, doing nothing, you know, they're failing every class, but you just keeping them because you like their parents' money, then yeah, this is an issue because there's students that could be taking those spots that absolutely deserve it. And yeah. that's all that's how I feel. I agree, um, you 100%. know, percent. Yep. But I, like I said, I can't. I, I remember when I was living along Long Island, one of my long time college buddies. I remember this place I used to work at, and this kid was about what, 15, 16. and he used to drive this this car. I think I think it was called the Viper or something. This car was like a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. A fifteen year old driving a hundred fifteen thousand dollar car, and. I remember just talking to him because we used to play basketball. I was like, yo, how did you get that? He's like, oh, yeah, my parents, yeah, they loaded. They they do all this. And he was telling me about the school he was already trying to go to. I think it was Princeton, one of the Ivy League schools. And I know to this day he's still – I think he's about to graduate, but he's in that school. And 
it, it, it it's just one of those things where I could hate on him. I could say, hey man, yo, you don't deserve that call. You know, I could rock. Well, I'm not a criminal, but I'm like, I don't hate this kid because he's enjoying that. You know, do I wish I had a hundred seventeen thousand dollar call? Absolutely, yeah. but yeah. I wouldn't hate on him for enjoying, you know, the things that he got because of his family. We yeah. all enjoy it. Not all, but some of us do. Um, but with that being said, let me ask you one uh, one thing. Do you think that we can just find a common ground? Um, like I said, there's always some negativity happening. You know, there's a lot of people said about these last Supreme Court rulings. Do you think there is a way for us to find a common ground on this? Or do you think it is what it is? Um, I believe that question, like that's my faith in humanity, is just uh, universally, I believe we are common ground and that we are in an evolutionary process of experiencing that and knowing it in our blood and bones. And I do have faith in Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. I do have faith that one day we wake up and we don't even think about it. It's like breath. We know that if I hurt you, I'm hurting myself. Oh, that's beautifully said. Um, you know, TMZ is calling me again. Beyonce apparently wants to be with me. <laughs> I, I can't get, you know. Put them glasses afraid. back on. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Where did it go? <laughs> um, you know, this, this has been a really good conversation. And I think... You know, I, I want to bring you back on to have some um some more conversations. Um, I'd love you know, that. I I got I got a you know dinner meeting with Kim Kardashian of all people. Can you believe it? Um, and not <laughs> tell her I say hi. She oh, won't I know who's saying hi, but tell her I say hi. <laughs> I'll make sure by the end of the night I do. No, <laughs> um, but you know, you know, you you're an amazing guy, man. You are very insightful. Um, you know, you care about people. We don't get to hear people like that often. Like I said, there's a lot of negativity going on. A lot of people, you know, very hatred, a lot of hatred in this society now. Um, but, you know, before we go, where can people listen to your podcast, find you? I know you have a website and all that, but I'll let you do the honors. Where can people find your amazing all right. work? All right. So, uh, Moped Outlaws is mopedoutlaws.com. And live with Greg lives at gregorywilker.com, G R E G O R Y W I L K E R.com. And uh, that's kind of the linchpin for everything that I'm about right now the good, the bad, and the ugly. ugly. So <laughs> <laughs> there is some ugly. <laughs> Trust me, I have my ugly days. I don't always wake up this good looking. All right. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you know, actually, anybody, you know, check out the episode. I, I'm forgetting the name of it. I know it was something about here in the the episode. What was it? Uh, do you remember the name of my episode? No, our episode. I'm not off the top of my head. Oh, I was just looking at it earlier before. Oh, oh crap. Hold on. Um, hold on. Now you got me wondering. So. <laughs> I know um, something here. Keep talking while I look it up. <laughs> uh, what is it? Grow my hair. Something else. Grow my own hair. Do my own thing. That's where it was. There we go. Uh, you know, that, that that's the episode of you, you know, need some help with your charisma, confidence, and you just want to hear more from both of us, check that out. You know, he's a great guy, uh, amazing host, him and his, uh, his co-host, uh, amazing dudes, you know, doing a lot of great work. And, you know, I actually got to check out, I heard your, um, you know, I was paying attention to the Live With Greg. I, I want to watch a couple of those episodes. It was pretty interesting. I, I saw the one. Where I think it was the the filmmaker uh, girl. I think last year she was about to shoot her fourth film or something, and it was like a bonus episode. Um, oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. And she was doing that whole thing on uh, sterilizing women that took place in, um, gosh darn it, I forget the country. Yeah. Was it India or? No, it was like Switzerland or some sort of like country that you I I personally didn't associate with that kind of thing, but it was based on you know the story was fictional but it was based on a real historical thing which of course resonated with as i was learning about racism and stuff hearing how people of color go in for a uh, minor medical procedure and come out sterile and that there's so much historical chaos i have learned about this country and the 
inhumane practices of racism is enough to keep us up all night and yes. you know we could talk yeah. about this all day we yes. wouldn't even be able to talk about it in a matter of five hours this is, yeah it's you know i appreciate people like her who do work like that a couple of films i've done except the call was based off a true story uh, a couple kids from minneapolis black kids who got caught up you know with the fbi and i think all of them are still locked up in federal prison to this day um and you know people who go out there and do work like that you know it takes a, it takes a special person and we need more people like that unfortunately the problem is these superhero movies which i do want to be a part of but <laughs> i will say these superhero movies are ruining that type of experience but Hopefully we will get to that point where, you know, especially the film festivals will give those type of films the yeah. recognition they deserve because yeah. they definitely yep. deserve it. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, well, but you know, a... yeah, yeah. What, what, what you want to say to the most no, I was just going to say it's been a pleasure hanging with you today. I really thank you for welcoming me into your world. Anytime. I will walk through the door anytime. Absolutely. I, is, that, is that Tom Cruise behind you? Uh, no, I, I saw a camera behind you. Ah! <laughs> TMZ man, they, they... <laughs> maybe I need a pair of glasses. <laughs> I got you. I got another. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What's your address? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, Greg, like I said, um, amazing. This episode, you know, is two parts. You know, I hope everybody enjoys it. I'll have him back on. We're going to talk about a lot more stuff that I think is very beneficial to me, him, and everybody as well. And like I always say, I hope a hand. It's a better hand. If TMZ calls you asking about me, you haven't heard from me. I'm out. Greg is out. We'll see you guys later. Peace. Peace.